Okay, so uh, this, this just, like I said, this just popped in my head. Like I didn't, you know, I, I, when I started this in regression in, in the Coursera course, we talked most about the linear regression assumptions, but I don't remember that they talked too much about the logistic regression assumptions. And there are a couple of them, okay, that you should be aware. And this, this is, you know, like a, I just did it in half an hour, you know, so there, there, could, be, there, there could be a couple of spell checks there. But uh, this, these are the sources mainly, the six assumptions of logistic regression, and also another one from, uh, from the medium uh, tower signs, okay? Uh, in this one, the, the, you know, the language that they use is Python, okay? But more or less, you know, the same applies, you know, to if you're going to do it in, in R. So the first assumption that is mentioned is that the response variable, you know, the one that you are trying to predict, the dependent variable, uh, in, it must be binary, okay? Or if you have more than one outcome, then you should use something called ordinal regression, okay? But let's stick with the binary, which is the simplest one, like the simple linear regression, uh, simple. So for example, if you have a, a, a response variable that is yes or no, male or female, uh, pass or fail, okay? Uh, you know, uh, binary outcomes, okay? So then, uh, you can, you know, a logistic regression can, can be the model for that. Then in the assumption number two, uh, it comes this, uh, this assumption that is also in the linear regression, which are that observations should be independent. In other words, they shouldn't be correlated, you know, through the sequence of ob observation. And that's where the IP independent and identical distributed comes about. The way to check this, like in linear regression, is just to check the plot of residuals. So remember that function plot, it gives you, you know, a couple of charts. The first one, the residuals, that's why you have to check it, to see if the residuals seem random, have a random pattern, or they go in a certain, you know, <laughs> they go in a, in a certain sway. Uh, assumption number three, uh, again, like in linear regression, no multicollinearity among predictors, okay? So that's applied to both the linear and the, and, the, and, the, and the logistic. And of course, you can use BIF, you know, the BIF uh, function to check multicollinearity. And usually if you have something more than 10 between the factors, then it shows that they're, you know, highly, high, highly, highly uh, correlated, okay? Then assumption number four is that you should not have no extreme outliers. The same thing applies also to linear regression. So most of them are you know, similar to the linear regression. And in the extreme outliers, what you have to do is in one of the plots, I think it's the fourth plot that you do with the plot function, you get what is called a Cook distance. So it is kind of the leverage of that point you know, to the model. Okay, so if you, if you have a lot of them, you have to be you know, aware and see if you can, maybe you can remove them, or maybe you can, uh, you know, do a transformation also, you know, in that in that in that predictor, okay, you know, log transformation, square, etc., to see if you can then minimize that, you know, that distance, uh, the Cook distance. Okay, then this is it goes at, at, at the heart of the matter, right? Remember that the logistic regression, what we're doing is doing what is called a logic, right? A log. In other words, we, we, we are uh, using a log to then, uh, you know, predict if the, if, the, if, if the outcome is going to be or zero or one. That's what the log, you know, uh, uh, give us. So in the assumption number five, and this is unique to logistic regression, is that there has to be a linear, a linear relationship between the predictors, the planetary variables, and the log, the logit, and the log of the response variable, okay? So as we know that in linear regression, for example, you have a direct relationship between those predictors and the dependent variable. Here, the relationship is to the log of the outcome, okay? The logic, in, in other words, the log odds, okay? And this is the, you know, the, the definition logic of the probability is the probability, you know, divided by the complement, you know, the one minus, minus, minus P. So the way to do it, and this was, you know, kind of interesting. That's why, you know, I had to do a little bit of uh, uh, scripting here. Is that for assumption number five, 
you need a test called the box Tidwell test, okay? And this is a t-test, like the t-test to get the p-values to be if it's significant or not. In this one, in the box Tidwell, what it does is that it checks if the relationship is linear or not. In other words, the null hypothesis is that the relationship is linear. If you get a lower p-value, less than, let's say, 0 0.05, which is the standard, then um, you, you, can, you can reject that linear uh, assumption and then say that there's a nonlinear relationship. So in this example, I uh, took the Titanic, you know, one of the quintessentials, you know, that I said that mostly, you know, we, we, uh, we, we start. And then I just chose three, uh, uh, you know, three uh, observations, okay? I'm sorry, three features. The survive, which is the target, okay? And it says zero and one, if you survive the Titanic or not, uh, you know, a disaster. The age of the, of the person and the, how much they pay, the fare of the, you know, uh, the ticket, okay? So the, for those three, just for, you know, to get an example, an, uh, an experiment of what the, you know, the box title, uh, title uh, Tidwell uh, uh, test does. Okay, so with, the, with those, I build my model, right? Okay, I do the GLM uh, function. Okay, this is base R. Uh, survive and then predicted by the age and the fare, the data is Titanic and the family. This is important. The family is bi binomial with the link uh, equal to logic. Okay, you know, we're going to apply the log, you know, to the binomial outcome. Then when we get the summary of the, of the function, then we get our intercept, we get the, you know, the estimate of the age. Remember that this is an exponent, okay? So you have to exponentiate to get the true value of it. And then we get the p-values, okay? So uh, I, I, I did the summary because, you know, you want always, you know, to see, you know, what is the relationship, right? And usually what happens is that because it's a negative uh, relationship, that means that uh, the person that had more, you know, more years, more years versus other that were young, those that have more years have a less probability of surviving than the young ones, okay? And if you see the data, you will see that, you know, people that were older usually were more prone, more probable to die in the Titanic than the younger ones, okay? And then in the fair, uh, the fair, although it is significant, uh, the fair really is not that strong. Okay, right now, you know, like if you pay more, for example, you'll get a probability. It's not that 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 you know that 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 strong, but it's a positive one. In other words, if you pay, if you pay more for the fare, maybe you get in a higher class of the Titanic. Then the probability is that you know you will survive. Okay, that's what he's saying. Th those signs that that's what he's saying. Negative that the more quantity you have in that the predictor, the less probability you have of survive. Okay, so. Let's go then to what we want, which is that test, okay? Testing if there's a linear relationship between the predictors. So I had to do this, okay? Because when I did the, 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 the test with, the, with just the age and the fare, it gave me an error, okay? And the problem is that the log of something less than one, for example, if the age is 0.6 or 0.7 or a, a newborn, a child, and any more baby. So if it is between zero and one, it's going to throw an error because it, the log is a negative a number, okay? So the log of one, you know, base 10 will be zero, right? So anything less than one will be, uh, will be negative and it throws an error. The same thing as the fair. There's some fairs that are zero, okay? You know, that maybe they're unknown or maybe there were, you know, there's no enough information to get a number there. So that's how the data is, you know, is, is presented. So what I had to do is do a little bit of transformation, a little bit of trick hack. And what I did was add one, okay, to the age for this test and not for the fair. So I'd avoid those negative values, right? So when I did that, then you see the results, okay, of that uh, test. So the results are, you know, very, very interesting. For the age, you get a statistic, a p-value of 0.18. So if the threshold is 0.05, for example, that means that 
the relationship between the log, the log of the response, and the age, you can assume that it's lead, okay? Because you don't reject that null hypothesis. But in the fair, which will, will have a very small number here, minus eight, right? You know, a, a point zero zero zero, you know, th those, those zeros. Then you can say that you can reject in the fair, you can reject the no hypothesis and then uh, accept the alternate, which is that that relationship between the survival, the, 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 the log of the survival and the fair is not linear. So what is the implication of this? Uh, for the model to be valid, then you will have to do something with the fair, okay? Maybe you have to transform it, okay? To make sure that it has that linear relationship. Because if not, that assumption is, not in, is going to invalidate statistically, is going to invalidate the model, okay? So that's something that, you know, you should have, you know, just yeah. in, in the back of the head, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, I mean, sometimes we 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 get you know good good R squares, uh, good R MSCs, but we have to check those assumptions. And sometimes you'll be amazed yeah, at some of the right. things that you're going to find, and then you have to tweak the model. Maybe it won't get that accurate, but at least it's a valid model, at least statistically. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. All right. So just to finish, there's another assumption. And the last assumption is that the sample size should be sufficiently large, okay? And that's very subjective, right? You know, how large be the sample? Maybe, uh -huh. you know, 100 observations, you know, it's a good if they're balanced, okay? If they're not balanced, then, you know, maybe you need more of that, on, uh, you know, on, on the surf class than the others. So this is a rule of thumb, just a rule of thumb, you know, uh, there's many, uh, many ways, you know, to figure it out. But for example, it says as a rule of thumb, if you have, let's say that you're predicting three, you have three explanatory variables, three predictors. And in one of them, you have a minimum of 10, okay? Or 10, you know, or 10, or 10 observations with a frequency outcome of 0.20. So the rule is that the sample size of that data set should be 10 multiplied by three, Okay, by, by uh, 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 sorry, you know, to the to the power of three, and then divided by 0.20, Okay, 10, 10 multiplied by three, sorry, 30, uh, 30 and then divided by 0.20. and that would be one fifty. So at least in that case, you will need at least one fifty observations. But since we are, you know, good data science, the scientists. One way to you know overcome this uh, deficiency is to do bootstrapping. Okay, so you can do bootstrap to create enough samples within your data set, so that then you can have you know enough uh, data, enough sample sample size to overcome this. But you should be also be you know be on the lookout for this. Okay. Okay. So that's oh. it. <laughs> Great. So um, I really like the the the, the last uh, tip <laughs> that was right. uh, bomb. Okay, excellent. excellent. Okay, so okay, so the, I, I will share this with uh, with Mike. Okay. Yes. Yes. If so can, can you can then them? maybe you can incorporate you can incorporate it in chapter four as our you know contribution to the to the book. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you put that uh, uh, in the chat if you have uh, uh, if that's in, in uh, your repo? I don't know. Um, uh, then... Yeah, I, I mean, I could, I could try, but um, uh, if, because I know that Michael was doing some already some, you know, some additions there. Uh, maybe what we can do is just, you know, incorporate it as something like an addendum or something, you know, to it. Okay. Yeah, or, okay. or you could. You, 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 you let me know. Add a section. Uh huh. You could just add a section to your to your fork and then push that as well. Okay. You know, like a section titled "Logistic Regression Assumptions" at some point. Okay. Then I'll send you a link sure. where the, there is the explanation how to do that. On the on the test. Yeah. Yeah, it's right here. Okay, let me copy it. Uh, 
let me okay. see in the chat. Okay. Okay, uh, so see that we have uh, talked about the bootstrapping. Uh, mm -hmm. This chapter talks about these things, this cross validation and bootstrapping. So uh, we can see uh, some labs, maybe and that would be mm -hmm. the best way to uh, maybe go through the this thing. Um, the, uh, the book, which is this one here, okay, so, uh, the, the, the theory, uh, so the, the, the part of the theory is, um, um, like, um, talking about the, uh, resampling methods and in particular cross validation and bootstrapping. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so mm, I think the best way to it's not very so very straightforward. Uh, and uh, when you go through the labs, uh, you understand the, the, the theory uh, because this time is a, a bit more uh, a practice chapter. Um, so you need to load this, these uh, packages. I've loaded the study models, but we, we won't use it uh, because I, I just followed the, the book um, suggestions. So um, uh, the first example that it does, it does with the auto uh, data set, which is, um, uh, a data set uh, that contains, uh, uh, you know, uh, information about cars. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you can see, this is the dimension uh, 392 uh, and nine variables. So 392 observation and variables. What it does for us to get inside the, the meaning of uh, the importance of validation set approach and uh, the importance of making cross validation, that means making more um, uh, sampling uh, of your data to verify if um, there is differences within the mean square errors level. Uh, the first thing uh, he does is making a training uh, train set, but so we are not using tidy models. So he does uh, um, with sample, and what he's doing uh, that is made um, he's making the index uh, of of the data set. So then you can uh, target the so I mean the the row numbers, then you can target these row numbers on your data set so to divide it into data sets. Mm -hmm. um, this for this reason, uh, the sample is one hundred and ninety six because it's half of the total uh, number of observation. So this is um, the classical way to make a training set. Now I do sample uh, of this um, uh, 196 ob uh, observation. And uh, the, it, it will uh, release a certain number of, uh, so certain numbers that they will be, they are the indexes um that i will use to uh, target the observation in my data set so to split it uh, randomly into the separate data, data set so this is a first visualization of the, the data um, and the what he wants to do is to um, predict mpg based on the level of horsepower mm -hmm. okay uh, the first visualization shows a quite linear uh, trend within these two uh, variables. So uh, 
uh, he make uh, he makes oops, uh, a linear model, okay, with the MPG and the host power data auto, uh, but then he, um, in the in the base are modeling because I used to tidy models, so this um, this is the way in base uh, model to use the training set. So you use the data and then subset in the training set. In this case, it's not a set, but are, it's so it's are the number of uh, of, um, um, of rows of the of observation uh, randomly selected. So um, uh, having uh, made this uh, linear model, the uh, objective is to uh, identify the mean square error level and select the one within different sampling samples with uh, these sampling techniques, uh, which one is the best. Uh, and so uh, to, to define the, the robustness of, of the model. Uh, so the, here is a calculation of the mean square error. Uh, this is my way to do the things, but uh, the, the, the way in the book is just this thing. Mm. I don't know if you have any questions about this. Um, so this is uh, the, the first fit uh, with um, no a pol polynomial of, ordine, of order one. And uh, then he calculated the mean square error, and then he replicates the fit um, uh, two more times uh, with different uh, uh, level of polynomials, mm -hmm. uh, quadratic and cubic. Mm -hmm. yep. that, that's absolutely clear, no? Yeah, and as well, he calculates again the mean square error for um, both uh, new uh, model fits with the polynomial. So then I have uh, uh, put everything inside a data frame. So we have uh, the mean square error of uh, all of them, the uh, <clears throat> sample, uh, this is seed, seed one. And uh, so it, it, in the linear model with polynomial one, the linear model, the fit two and fit three. And these are the three values of the mean square error. <clears throat> and is there any questions about how, or, or do you know, I don't know, I'm not sure if, uh, do you have any questions how to m calculate the mean square error? Maybe, no. Um, okay. And um, so the, the next mm. step is to try seeing that uh, the first fit with three different level of polynomials releases these three, three values of mean square error. Then to see what happens if we uh, try a different sample and see if mm. the results that we obtain are consistent uh, and what is the difference uh, between uh, if, uh, what is best if using just a linear model or a cubic or a quadratic, what is the difference? So he does again the same thing, but this time uh, basically changed the, the, the seed, no? So now, uh, the procedure is the same, but the, the, the sample is different. So this bucket of numbers, which uh, are the, the raw numbers the, the, um, of the data set that I want to select for making the training set is different. So I'm making a new training set. Okay. So I do the same procedure. And the result is here, and I've put everything inside uh, 
uh, unified data set. The result is, can be see, seen here, is that, uh, um, so this is seed one. So my first try making uh, a training set, and this is the second. So a different uh, combination. So I, I have extrapolated two different uh, training sets, okay? And then I've calculated, uh, use it for making models with a linear model, a, um, a quadratic <coughs> polynomial and a cubic polynomial. And then what I found is that the first um, training set shows uh, a difference from, from the second set. So as you can see, if I change uh, the selection of information inside my data set, the results changes. Mm -hmm. And what is important to say is that the different the difference can be seen um, much with the cubic and the quadratic uh, models. As you can see, the, the highest, highest value belongs to, uh, for, um, uh, sorry, the lowest value belongs to the um, polynomial, uh, um, the cubic polynomial, okay? So, uh, but the, this has to be still investigated. Um, this, uh, uh, definitely the uh, quadratic polynomial, so the polynomial of the ordine, order two, this one here, um, ap appear to be the best one to use. Okay, in fact, here I've ordered all the, all the results by the um, lowest value the, of the mean square error. And the first one is my uh, first uh, selection, uh, set seed one. So my first training um, sample with a polynomial of order two. Then uh, the second place is for the cubic in my first uh, training. And uh, the third is my second uh, training set with a cubic polynomial. So, and this uh, says that uh, a simple linear model for this data set uh, with, no, with polynomial of order one is not uh, very good. And looking back at the data, first visualization, we can see that uh, maybe a polynomial uh, of order greater than one will switch better the data because it's not very straight uh, mm -hmm. line. It's right. so, okay. So, uh, also, the, um, one of the, the way to um, verify uh, that, so we say that it's not exactly a linear model, no? So we may want something with a bit of movement. And um, for, uh, we can use for this uh, purpose, generalized linear models. But, and there is a reason for which in the book, this GLM uh, model is used um, because it can be uh, applied inside the function uh, cv.glm. Right. Okay. So um, we are now talking of uh, leave one out cross validation, which means uh, I take all my data set and then I take one of the information of your observation out as a uh, testing uh, set, okay? And I use all the other. Um, 
to to see how uh, this live one out cross validation works uh, the book so the authors uh, propose to use the G, um, glm function which is which will work exactly as the same as a linear model uh, when is not specified the family because usually I use general linear model, GLM with family binomial, for example. Okay. When I, I want to do um, uh, no, a non linear model, so a logistic regression. But this way, I can, uh, without specifying the family binomial, use GLM function as a linear regression for making a linear regression. So it's like as the same as using the, the LM function, but this way, in fact, they make a comparison. And as you can see, exactly the same result. Um, uh, this way I can use this function inside my cross-validation GLM function. Okay, so um, the cross-validation GLM function um, uh, releases a delta vector, which is uh, which contains the cross-validation result or the leave one out statistic. What is uh, leave one out cross-validation? Leave one out cross-validation estimate for the mean square error, the test error uh, as the average of the number of tests error estimated. Okay, so to the, the formula of the cross validation is the, the average of the mean square error based on the number of observation. Okay. So uh, the authors propose to use this library boot, this package boot, because he um, th there is this function, cross validation GLM, and um, this function releases this delta uh, with the. Um, the cross validation uh, value, which is the mean of the mean square error. Mm. Okay. Uh, if if we go back here you, and you see the list of the mean square errors that we have just calculated, more or less that could be the mean. Okay. If I do the mean of this vector, most probably I found something around 24. So this is the, um, the value that is released with this, uh, uh, with this function. To use this function, what I do, uh, apply the GLM model to my uh, um, outcome and a, a predictor without training set and anything, nothing. So, to the wall uh, set, to the, uh, the wall data set, and then apply the cross validation GLM function to the result of my model. We can see this. This is, uh, this is uh, GLM and releases the value that we can give an explanation about what what are the results. But then we put this fit inside the cross validation GLM. It takes a bit and releases a certain number of information, which within which you have this delta vector. And this delta vector is the average of the mean square error. I didn't see 
if I do this one. Okay, so I have a call, K, delta, and seed. These are the information inside. If you, I don't know, uh, I go forward, and then if you have any questions, uh, we go back to that. So then, what, what do we want to do? We want to see a series of these uh, uh, averages to see which one is the best, basically. Okay, so again, um, I set some indexes from zero to 10 because I want to replicate this GLM model 10 times with um, different type of polynomials, different level of polynomials, level one, two, three, et cetera, up to 10. Okay, so they made a, a four, which is taking lots of times compared to other uh, solutions. And they propose a different solution, which is very faster. So it takes a bit, not, not a lot of time, but it takes a bit, and release it um, a vector, uh, so a list of numbers which, with different uh, levels of this uh, uh, CV error. Because we want to mi ma minimize the test error. So this is the, uh, the graph which is made uh, with these values and uh, from one to 10 and one to 10 and are the uh, uh, level of polynomials. Okay. So uh, I'll go a bit fast uh, then to say mm -hmm. that we can do the same with a k-fold cross validation. And that means that exactly the same as before, but then, we replicated things 10 times, okay? So we specified inside the cross-validation GLM function, this K equals to 10. And again, ask for the delta values, and we have uh, um, the same values, okay? And this is uh, uh, computation is shorter, so takes um, quite less time than, than the other one. Okay. As you can see, if I um, repeat these things a certain number of times, I would obtain like uh, an, um, a chain um, of, of all possible observations, um, values of, of these uh, um, test errors to see which one would be the best. As you can see, there is a bit of difference within, within the two. And um, so this is uh, quite interesting. I don't know if you... So basically what I did it is to take, uh, put this, the, the, this information in a data frame. I set an ID colon from one to 10 so that I obtain something like that. I have the ID from one to 10, and then I have the CV error and the CV error 10. So this is with K fold, and this is with uh, leave one out. Then I did a pivot longer to have all of them in one mm. uh, unified information and made a plot to obtain these things. Obviously, if you have more, you, you have uh, uh, different values. For different values of kappa, 
you have different value of kappa, kappa 20, 30, 40, then you have slightly different results. So this is a way to uh, understand uh, when you, uh, because the problem is that you make a, a prediction and on the testing set, and then when you test it on the test set, you might find that your prediction is not that accurate. Uh, so the purpose of these things is to understand what would be the, the maximum error that you will make with, mm, with different type of samples. So in case you have, uh, you're going to test uh, your result into a different uh, new data, so to new data, you might find a difference. So you want to test your model. Um, how much difference releases within different samples? Um, there is uh, another way. Uh, um, it, it's, it's not another way, but it, it depends by the type of data. And uh, the, there is a technique which is called the bootstrap. And we know that the bootstrap approach can be applied to almost all situations, in particular in finance. So for this reason, they have proposed this uh, portfolio data set which has three, two, uh, they, they are um, investment, investment X, investment X, investment Y. And um, so we can estimate the accuracy of, of a statistic of interest. And uh, so we are searching for the value alpha. This value alpha will be the percentage that I would uh, invest in X and uh, uh, the, the remaining one minus alpha, um, um, I will decide to invest in the other in, in Y. So this is done to assess the variability associated with the regression coefficients in a linear model fit. So what we want is to quantify the uncertainty and choose an alpha, which will be able to minimize our total risk. And how do I identify the risk with the variance? Okay, so I want to calculate the variance of the investment to identify an alpha, which is lower enough for me to invest that uh, an amount to that fraction. Uh, so the, the variance is, uh, the formulation is this, and um, uh, the, um, mm, alpha, uh, the calculation of the alpha is uh, this so transformation of this equation. Okay, but uh, with R, computationally speaking, uh, what they do is they may have made a function, alpha function, with this formula to the two, uh, uh, you know, that would be applied to these two uh, vectors, X and Y. So the, this is the function. Okay. And uh, apply the function to my data set um, to the first 100 observations. This is the value that it releases. So I have 58% to be invested in X and 1 minus. Uh, this value to, to be invested in Y. So this is what, uh, what I've obtained. So now, uh, how, now I have alpha, but I need to construct a bootstrap 
okay? And uh, so I select 100 random observation from the range to uh, range one to 10 with replacement. And, and I compute an alpha, which is uh, estimated. And this alpha is, is estimated on new data. So to do this, I set the seed. And then uh, instead of just taking the first 100 of, of observation, I take a sample with replacement. Okay, of time of hundred, so they with replacement, and uh, I do this, and then finally apply the boot function, which is uh, you know if, if you know about this uh, this function. Bootstrap resampling generate R, uh, R bootstrap replicates of a statistic applied to R. So in general, the statistic to be bootstrapped can be as simple or complicated. And uh, so for, for making this bootstrap, what I do is using my data, apply my alpha function to R, which is a thousand replication, number of bootstrap replicates. Okay, so what I obtained is um, ordinary non-parametric bootstrap, and I have a standard error of 9%. This is my T value, which is alpha. Uh, this is, uh, okay, Let, let's go forward and say that I'm interested in this one, this standard error here. And then I want to estimate the accuracy of this linear of a linear regression model. And uh, I do this to assess the variability of the coefficient estimate and prediction. So when I, I do a linear regression model, I have beta one and beta two. So which is one is the intercept and one is the slope. So I, I want to estimate uh, assess the variability of the estimates for these two values. And uh, he made, uh, the, the authors have made a function, boot function, which is different from this boot strap function. And um, with a linear model, subset index, and um, to the entire data set, number of observations. Okay, so now they have repeated this thing twice and then calculate the standard error of a thousand bootstrap estimate for the intercept and the slope terms with the boot function. So they use the boot function with inside the boot function. <laughs> okay, so just as the same when we use the alpha inside, where is it? Inside the boot function, now we use the boot function. <laughs> okay. So the result of this is again, an ordinary non-parametric bootstrap with these standard errors. One, it's very slow, low, and one is very high. If I do the summary, I see that 
there is a difference. Okay. And then, um, again, repeat the procedure with a different sample. And do the summary again. Do you have any questions? I have uh, about these things. The, this last bit for me, uh, I didn't put much thought. Do you have any? Uh, I don't know a personal experience to share or something like that. In that last uh, question, uh, Federica, uh, you're adding a quadratic component uh, oh. you know, in the horsepower because you had the function or the horsepower predicting the MPG. In that last function of the bootstrap, you're adding the horsepower and then the quadratic of the horsepower to see if that you know, uh, gives a better, a, a better error. Okay, estimate. Okay, that plus I parenthesis horsepower to the power to the two. Yeah. Yeah, in, in the example that I use for, you know, for the linear regression, uh, they also use that, you know, that, that technique. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it, it's trying to see if, because that relationship is not, you know, totally linear. So there it has a, you know, a curve, a nonlinear component. What they're trying to do is to add that quadratic to see if that improves uh, the, you know, the model performance, okay, mm -hmm. from the, you know, from the errors. Uh -huh. but, but apparently, apparently it doesn't, because if you can see the standard error, you know, it goes, you know, it, it's higher. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, but it's something that the other that the authors, you know, uh, use uh, regularly. Apparently, you know, to illustrate illustrate certain techniques to try to you know get that nonlinear uh, relationship. Right, because if we have a look at uh, uh, this, I don't know if I can switch to select into Windows. Can you see my my Chrome? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. This is the uh, mm -hmm. tidy model, tidy model version. Yep. Yeah. And so if we uh, now we we are we have a minute left, but uh, so this is will be the last bit of the thing. Mm -hmm. And. Um, So basically released a, a certain number of alpha based on different uh, uh, samples. And then, mm -hmm. an nesting group and summarize to get an estimate of the variability of the slope and intercept. Right. So this is the variability because it's the estimate of the standard error. Mm -hmm. So uh, that, that would be interesting to do the exercises, at least the practice part, maybe next, next week about these things. There's quite a few. That would be nice to get inside, understand a bit better uh, about these things. If there's any exercises, so that there's there's some exercise. Okay. <laughs> so Jim has left us because uh, he sharply yeah. needs to go back to to work <laughs> at six. So uh, okay, so. Um, we see you next week.
Okay. All right. See you next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye.